This song was the theme song of a movie which is called China Night. And the idea was that we would hear spoken Japanese because the movie was a propaganda film to show that the Chinese and Japanese could get along. But anyway, we heard it over and over and over and over until almost all of us could sing it by heart. Jimmy was older than I was, and he got drafted sooner than I did, and he went into the January class of the Army Intensive Language School. You know, Jimmy could read Chinese and Japanese fluently. He had no trouble. He, he took his to. military service seriously, you know. There was no dissent or any pretense that he was unhappy. Oh, he was happy. His parents, I think, were divorced when he was very young. Neither of them really wanted him around. And my grandmother, meanwhile, was getting remarried to a man who didn't like the idea that she had a child. And he spent half the time with someone his mother chose who dressed him in lavender linen suits. And the other half of the time, he spent with someone his father chose and went barefoot. He stayed at a boarding house on Benvenue in Berkeley. You know, he had this difficult teenage family life with his parents divorcing, and he stayed apparently with, with his friends most of the time. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't affect him. He, you, you'd think he'd be sad or depressed or withdrawn or something, not at all. Jim Cale was, in a way, the pioneer of, of Chinese art history. One of our first conversations uh, was about his trip with C.C. Wong to Taiwan in the 50s to look at the treasures of the National Palace Museum. Um, he described how exciting it was for a young man who was with a connoisseur, renowned painter as well, to be able to come in contact with uh, the most important collection in the world at the time outside of China. It was a massive uh, undertaking in Chinese art history to create the kind of central archives of images of Chinese paintings that had been unknown to the West. And he was in charge of uh, opening up this chest, you know. Ultimately, just put his name on the map because the Skira publication was very successful. And it was really the first time anybody outside of the museum, the National Palace Museum, that is, and someone who was not of uh, nationalist Taiwan, to have encountered these uh, objects and, and artworks so close. He and my first husband, Hans Berwald, were very close. They were both in high school together. And he spent a great deal of time at the Berwald house where he became very interested in the art. And he used to say that that was his introduction to, as he called it, high culture. He received an invitation from the U.S. State Department to join a group of archaeologists who would travel to mainland China at their invitation and uh, visit all of the great archaeological sites that had been excavated during the Cultural Revolution period. He um, went on that trip in 1974 and wrote substantial letters back on a daily basis, sometimes two a day, uh, describing exactly what he had seen. There were works there that people thought had been lost during the Japanese occupation or World War II um, that Suddenly, there they were. Two years later, in 76, he was invited back. With the second trip, he was already a very well-known figure in China. And he then regularly, yearly, was invited back, either to lecture or eventually to stay for periods of time and teach there. We met at the, the International House in Washington, which was a Quaker um, group. And he, uh, there was a piano in the living room, 
and he left his music on the piano, and I told him that if he did that, it would be stolen, and it was stolen. Oh, he was a very good father. He really was. I remember my father building a ship. I was very interested in whaling at the time, and Moby Dick and so forth, and so my dad built us a ship, or built me a ship in the backyard out of scrap wood with a mast and a crow's nest that I could climb up to, and um, he, he was very interested in building things, this available wood carpentry that he liked. He had a large collection of 78s, and that's the way we would really listen to music. And he would stack them on the, on the player, and so you know they'd drop one by one. And that was part of the whole music listening experience for me, was the thunk of the 78 coming down. So he'd get out his pipe, he'd smoke his pipe, and we wouldn't do anything else. We would just sit there and listen to, you know, Mahler's Ninth Symphony or Das Lied von der Erde, he loved. I got into the uh, Restless Landscape Seminar, uh, which went for a year and a half. Um, and that was the most intensive seminar experience I had at Berkeley. We were preparing um, a exhibition and a catalog with it. Um, studying 17th century painting. Um, and at that time, there was very little of this going on. Um, it was really a, a groundbreaking seminar and educational experience. We all went back east um, and to visit collections. We went to Cleveland, New York, Boston, and Princeton. It was something of a joke to have uh, eight women in a seminar, but Jim delighted in this fact, I think. So when we went to Princeton, we confronted another group of graduate students working with Wen Fang, who was, of course, Cahill's dear friend, but also arch nemesis, as we understood it. You know, they had a wonderfully friendly, contentious relationship over the course of their careers. And uh, his students were all men. So it was a very interesting moment, and I, you know, Cahill has written wonderfully about it himself in his uh, blog and in some of his shorter pieces where he describes the moment when the two groups came together in his hopes that we would, of course, all fall in love and marry one another, and of course that didn't happen. But he found out after we got back to Berkeley that we were being described by our friends at Princeton as Cahill's Red Detachment of Women. One visual image from that uh, stays with me to this day, and in Needham, Massachusetts, when we were going to stay at the home of a former graduate student of his. Uh, it had snowed, it was uh, bitterly cold, um, and we were all walking in file, and there was Jim at the front of the pack, as it were, uh, puffing away on his pipe, um, and a string of ladies, and I was near the tail end of this, so I got the scene, and it just holds in my mind of this kind of arc uh, with him leading the way through the snow at a, at a significant pace as he was wont to do. Just nonstop uh, energy uh, looking at images and looking at paintings. He never got sick of it. He never got tired. He never even felt normal hunger pangs it seems. It was just extremely um, impressive I have to say. But I don't think any of us could keep up with him in that regard. The riverbank caused much discord uh, between us because Jim was so passionately, I mean, he really yes. went off the deep yeah. end with the riverbank. This was a painting that belonged to C.C. Wong, who was a very good friend of Jim, Jim's over many, many decades. They traded paintings and had a great relationship as collectors. So that painting was purchased by the Met. And they decided, because it was such a big deal, that they would um, have a big conference around it, and they invited Jim to participate. C.C. Wong claimed it was an original work by this 10th, 10th century master. Um, Cahill, on the other hand, believed that it was a modern forgery by none other than Zhang Da Chen, who was the, the artist that actually got me interested in the field. I went to New York just to be there because I figured Jim was going to be attacked by these New Yorkers who think they know everything. And they're wrong. And they hang out that painting re repeatedly. I go and look at it again, and I'm absolutely sure it is not a genuine painting of that period. The overwhelming public opinion, which was uninformed, of course thought the Met and Richard Barnhart could do no wrong. And I don't deny them their freedom to say whatever they want, but not to knock 
Jim down personally like that. That was really embarrassing. Though the fact is that the debate began with the claim that this particular painting was by this famous artist, Dong Yuan by name. The Metropolitan Museum no longer stands by that claim. It is now attributed to Dong Yuan. To me, Jim is not just a person of great learning <clears throat> and uh, articulate scholar in Chinese art and uh, uh, able to persuade other people to show interest, but also somebody who knows uh, art from other angles, music, films, opera, you know, and, and, and he can talk anything about this subject. Those of us who were fortunate to be in his orbit, even a little, uh, were you know, warmed by the man and his vision. And through him, we were, were warmed by you know, centuries of art. Not just Chinese art, in my case, Japanese art, but, but all art, music, literature, uh, from ancient Chinese poets and painters to uh, E.M. Forster and others. He was an extremely generous scholar. He was very willing to share his materials with students and with researchers. We went out in the world thinking everybody was going to give us things, <laughs> you know, we, and people yeah. weren't like that. He invested so much in you that somehow he knew you were going to be great, even if you weren't right then. And it was, I guess, those, that future possibility that made him love us. He published a book called Pictures for Use and Pleasure, and in it, in the last chapter, he was um, able to describe his um, passion for this form of 18th, mostly 17th, 18th century Chinese painting of beautiful women, or Mei Ranhua. And uh, I said to him after I read the book, uh, and that chapter in particular, I said, we really should do an exhibition of this. What do you think about that? And he said, absolutely, let's do it. Julia sent me an email and asked, uh, whether I was interested and would like to, to contribute um, a, uh, entries for the catalog. And I said, oh, yeah, of course, I would love to. He had all these notes. He had uh, slides. He had digital images. And anything that he could think of, he would give me to take and read and to, um, uh, to help find the paintings, uh, you know, in various private collections that he, he knew a little bit about. One of the main arguments of this, or assumptions of this show, uh, was about uh, women in these paintings were supposed to be courtesans. So I asked Professor Kayu, do you think all of them were really courtesans? And he said, it is unclear sometimes, but he was very sure they were not the first wife. This area of Chinese painting is rather new, and it's something that a lot of people weren't taking very seriously. It was a true collaboration. We worked very closely, and we, we talked many times about which paintings really belonged in the exhibition and, and uh, how we could best get across the message that we were trying to do. And, and almost everyone who came to the exhibition were blown away by the interpretation that Professor Cahill and I worked out, largely because of, of his own research in terms of who these women were and what they were doing in the paintings and what the meaning was behind the objects that they were surrounded by were totally new and, and uh, a, a huge contribution to the field in a very, very unique area of Chinese painting. At that point in his life, when we opened the show, he was quite ill and was just barely able to make the exhibition. But he did come to the opening, and I, I took him, Sarah and uh, Benedict brought him to the museum, and I took him around the gallery, and he kept saying, why are the lights so low? <laughs> Turn the lights up. And that was always a problem for him, because you know we have to keep like five, six candle lights on these paintings, and, and he always wanted the lights a little bit brighter, but we, um, we compromised, and he was all right with it. But And then he spoke at the opening, and and um, said again how pleased he was that, that these paintings were finally getting the recognition that they deserved, and he was very pleased that they were able to be um, you know, presented in this exhibition. He wrote on his blog, he said, the thing that scares me is not death. The thing that scares me is that there's so much in my mind 
that I need to get out before it's too late. He really believed that his immortality would reside in what he wrote. And that that's why I think he was so prolific in a sense, you know, that he was, he was very adamant at the end of his life when he couldn't really write anymore actively using the keyboard himself. He wanted to do his video series and he wanted it all to be out there. It's as though he wanted to create this virtual Im immortal self that would live on forever and to a large extent he succeeded it seems to me. I do miss him and I and whenever I do I go to the website and uh, I watch um, sometimes a few minutes and sometimes a few hours of, of him uh, lecturing and it feels like he's still there but uh, that's the closest I can get. I think of him with great fondness and uh, regret that I didn't spend more time with him in the years that we were you know, relatively close here when I was here at Stanford. And All these things that I think I, I have to be able to ask him and wish I knew more about or just something that I think of and I think, oh, I can ask Dad that, and you can't. So, no, it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard. Do you miss him? Very much. Yeah. I think everybody does. Now you have to admit that was beautiful.